Today will be about electromagnetism. It is the last section of notes in the uh, fields unit. Um, a version of these notes can be found online on May 12th and 13th. I've kind of amalgamated uh, those two dates together in this little video and trimmed out a bunch of stuff uh, like Lenz's Law and, uh, and uh, Coulomb's Law. So <clears throat> those things, they're, they're important, but uh, uh, our government who wrote the curriculum didn't think that uh, you guys absolutely needed to know it. So uh, that has been trimmed out. Uh, it's worth reading. Uh, so do give it a read online. Um, I'm not going to test you on it, just as a heads up. So just keep that in the back of your mind if you do read all those notes. Uh, if you're going on to university and have ambitions of becoming any kind of electrical engineer or uh, know that you're going to work with uh, a lot of electricity in the future, it's worth giving a read. So on that note, um, oh, wouldn't be a bad idea if you watch this video. Uh, it's about electromagnetic induction. Um, it just goes a little bit beyond uh, this video lesson. Normally we'd kind of talk about electromagnetic induction. I'd show you examples in class, but uh, you can just watch that video instead and that'll be good enough for our purposes. So <clears throat> electromagnetism. So way back when a man by the name of Hans Christian Orsted was just kind of doing some little tinkering in his garage and he had a circuit that was connected across his table and around that circuit he had he had compasses uh, just sort of randomly so this was an accidental discovery and he t discovered that when he turned on his apparatus so right now this compass is aligned north when he turned on uh, the device it deflected the compass so it created a, uh, a bit of a deflection perpendicular to the actual uh, flow of the current so that was an accidental, accidental discovery that kind of kick-started our um, <clears throat> electromagnetic revolution that created uh, all the uh, gadgets and computers and transistors and lasers that really got us going through this last century. So this really revolutionized uh, modern civilization, just this cute little thing. Um, they didn't really know what this would be mean at the time. In fact, it just seemed like a cute little, oh, big deal. So what else? So watch, who cares? Uh, but it's amazing what tiny little discoveries eventually lead to. So let's talk about current for a quick second. Current is the rate of flow of electric charge as it passes through a cross-sectional area. So how fast are the charges actually moving through this section? The charge, of course, we measure by uh, Q. So that's the symbol we have for electric charge, which we measure with the symbol C, so for Coulomb. Uh, time, of course, we're going to keep on using the second, and uh, current, of course, would just be the uh, uh, division of those two together. So how fast are the charges moving, in other words? Uh, and so we measure that in something called the amp, ampère pour les personnes en français, but otherwise amps, because that's usually how we uh, abbreviate things. So big capital A, it means Coulomb per second. Remember, Coulomb is big capital C. Now, uh, there's two ways of looking at current. There's conventional flow, how it was designed, how it was kind of, I want to say invented. It's probably, that's kind of the wrong word, but I'm going with it. Um, <clears throat> it, was, it was first thought that uh, flow would be kind of like a waterfall. It go from the high elevation of water to the lower elevation. That's kind of how water falls work. Uh, and that is how current was first sort of thought of. Uh, it turns out, electron was sort of discovered shortly thereafter, and we kind of determined that, oh, well, that's not right. Electrons aren't going to go from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. Electrons hate other negatives. Electrons are going to go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So that's actually the flow of electrons. So even though current is mainly defined as from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, we know electrons are flowing in the exact opposite direction. So there's two ways of defining current. There's your conventional method, uh, where you just say it's going from positive to negative, and then there's your electron flow of current, which goes in the exact opposite direction. If you have very basic, simple circuits, like you connect uh, two leads of a battery to a light bulb, it's not going to matter which way you think current's flowing. The light bulb's going to turn on. Uh, it's not until you get into complicated circuits that will involve uh, transistors where maybe the flow of electrons is somewhat important. Uh, and then you have, so that's for direct current. Then you have alternating current where uh, the charges just flow back and forth and vibrate on the spot. Um, but that goes beyond this lesson. So just be aware, typically uh, in this video, in fact, uh, in all of your problems as well, 
it's going to just assume that current is flowing from the positive to the negative because that's the conventional flow of current. <clears throat> so suppose you have a metal leaf electroscope and it has, it's missing 12.5 uh, billion uh, electrons. So therefore it has 12.5 billion excess positive charges and you ground that. So you touch it to the ground and it allows the electrons to flow in. So I, this time we are going to talk about electron flow. And it discharges completely in uh, 0.5 of a second. So calculate the average current in the grounding wire. Uh, so for that, I'm going to get rid of this nice picture of an electroscope. Remember from a few videos ago when we were talking about the fundamental uh, uh, charges, you know, the law of fundamental charges. I'll go with my little stick diagram because this is how I typically draw them. So we're missing electrons, so therefore we have electrostatic force of repulsion between the two metal leaves, right? The two metal leaves don't like each other, so they're gonna diverge quite a bit. Uh, if you ground it, so this is the, the moment you ground it, right? Electrons are gonna flow through. And as soon as you ground it, those electrons are gonna flow through and those two leaves are gonna fall limp. They're gonna go hang straight down because for every positive, we'll have a negative. So electrons are flowing through and they're going to make it so this thing uh, basically obeys gravity. Right now they're not obeying gravity, they're spread apart. Now they're obeying gravity. You can think of it that way if you want. So <clears throat> I wasn't given the actual charge. I was just told how many electrons are kind of flowing in. And so therefore I have to calculate the amount of charge. Now charge is the number of elemental charges. And so therefore in order to calculate the current, I've got to combine these two equations. So when I substitute in NE for Q, I end up with an equation uh, for current in this context to be n times e divided by your time. So your number of charges multiplied by the fundamental value of charge all divided by time. So plug in your math, right? The only unit you really have to worry about is your coulomb and your second. You end up with a coulomb divided by a second, which by definition is an amp. And so you end up with about, about four nanoamps. Uh, at this point, I don't remember what the actual number was, but I remember I rounded this up. Uh, to two significant figures. Uh, so four nanoamps, that's not a very large amount of current. You wouldn't even feel that. So if this was you with a little metal leaf electroscope, you wouldn't even get a zap. You wouldn't feel a shock. Current would flow through you, but you'd never notice. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not until it gets you to a higher amount of current where you might get a zap. And typically it's the current that'll actually kill you, not the voltage. Uh, so something for a future lesson. Okay, so if we're back to magnetic fields and we go back to Orsted, <clears throat> he discovered that, oh look, if you have current flowing through a wire, it's going to uh, deflect a compass. And so what that means is your current is creating a magnetic field just by passing through a wire. So essentially you have the flow of charges passing through a conductor and it can create a magnetic field which can deflect a compass. Or if you see to the left here, this is an actual metal wire and they've got a nice blue backdrop and whoever did this put a whole bunch of metal filings, iron filings around it. And as soon as you pass current through it, all these little iron filings sort of arranged along the uh, magnetic field lines. And you can see all the concentric circles uh, made by the uh, uh, rearranging the little iron file, just like a compass. Did. So <clears throat> there's just sort of a visual if you want for, hey, this is creating a magnetic field because look what it's doing to iron, which is typically uh, uh, magnetic. So that means we got to kind of figure out the flow of the magnetic field around a conductor. And that's where right hand rule number two comes in. Right hand rule number two is pretty straightforward as far as I'm concerned. Essentially imagine any conductor as just a long uh, cable, like a long rod, if you will. Uh, and you just basically grip your right hand around it and point your thumb in the direction that the current is flowing and your fingers will wrap around in the direction of your magnetic field. So if my current is flowing up, I'll just say up on the screen here, I guess I could rotate this on the video. So if my current is flowing up on the page, then my magnetic field is going to wrap around counterclockwise. If my current was flowing down, the magnetic field would go in the exact opposite direction. So if it was given to you as homework, so this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, obviously, you're not going to draw a hand on your piece of paper. Um, so, but there is a thumb, if you will. This is kind of what would happen. You'd, you'd sort of visualize yourself putting your 
hand on the piece of paper. You'd probably grip it like this so that your knuckles were showing, the back of your hand was showing, and therefore you'd kind of visualize yourself grabbing onto it. Your fingers would wrap around on this far right hand side here. And as you'd represent this on paper, you'd probably say, okay, how do I draw this? Do I just draw a bunch of circles? Well, you can. Um, typically, I would do this. I would just say my current is flowing into the page on my right hand side, not my current, my magnetic field is flowing into the page on my right hand side, and my magnetic field is coming out of the page on my left hand side, right? Above the cable, it is going to the right, below the cable, it's going to the left. I don't typically draw that, but you can if you want. It's pretty self-explanatory if you know where it's going into the page and where it's coming out of the page, um, and that's good enough. You don't have to draw, uh, draw those X's going smaller as you move further away. The magnetic field gets weaker as you move further away because all fields uh, reduce in strength with increased distance. Of course, that is typically uh, an inverse square law rule. Uh, <clears throat> if you get into uh, Ampere's laws, uh, you'll, not exactly inverse square law, but it's the same idea, uh, but you can read into that. So eventually the toroid was kind of figured out. So in other words, just a, a loop. If you have a conductor where you create a loop out of it, you'll find that you can actually combine the magnetic field that it creates. So again, if you look here where my mouse is, uh, <clears throat> you have this little red uh, arrow here indicating the current. So technically we'd have a magnetic field wrapped around this little cable here. And it's not until you actually create a loop where you'll see, notice that uh, these magnetic fields kind of add up onto each other. And at the center of this loop, what you do is you end up with a much larger magnetic field. So the magnetic field created by the current flow in every single part of this loop ends up adding up and you get something much bigger and much stronger. And so that is one way to create a really strong magnet. You guys could actually do this yourself at home uh, if you actually have some spare copper cable. Um, and a nail even, uh, you can create these little toroids and connect them to a nine volt battery and you can watch uh, it move or connect to uh, a nail and make a cable, as long as it's connected to a battery, magnetic. So this is the whole basic idea of um, electromagnetism, creating a magnet that you can turn on and off. So <clears throat> there it is in principle, as you go around, essentially your hand would uh, stay wrapped around the entire time as your thumb wraps around that little loop and you would just add up every single little bit of it uh, and that's essentially all you really have to think about. What you end up doing is you create uh, <clears throat> a north and south pole magnet. So again, uh, current flow in the same way as this diagram here. If you envision your hand wrapped around your fingers coiling around, they'll always coil around so that your fingertips actually go through the center of this loop. And since we always draw our magnetic field such that, I'll use this little circle here, it flows from the north to the south. If you grip your hand around this, if you follow your thumb in the direction of your current, uh, your fingers will tell you always point towards your south pole of the magnet. So that's one way of knowing where the north pole is and where the south pole is of the magnet. So again, here's just a uh, real life visualization uh, of just a single loop and uh, a bunch of iron files around it. You can kind of see uh, an outline of where the magnetic field actually is. Solenoids are another example. So as you can see, a solenoid is just a series of multiple loops, all one single cable, but it's just wrapped around and around and around and around and around and around, and, around, and it creates a large electromagnet, <clears throat> essentially. And you can see that as you flow, so here's a little tiny arrow here, the direction of flow of current is going up here and then wrapping around on the right hand side, right? And then down on the left hand side. So if you get a hand involved, wrap it around there. <clears throat> so that's the direction of the flow. And so what I would typically do is I'd figure out what side that's curving around. I'd put my hand right there and I'd go to the very end and go, okay, it must be wrapping inwards. So again, my fingers would be able to go inside of the hole on that side, and that would make it the south pole. And so all those magnetic field lines are drawn so that they're coming out of the north end and pointing towards the south end. If you uh, wrap your hand on the other side, oops, moving things around needlessly. Uh, if you wrap your hand, I can't grab that. If you wrap your hand around the other side, your obviously your right hand would be flipped around and you still get the same idea. These fingers, I can't move it, I'll move the solenoid. Those fingers would just 
go inside of that uh, the hole in the solenoid. You'd swear I would have rehearsed this first. So uh, likewise here with uh, these solenoids, they're really good at moving magnets. If you put some kind of a magnet inside of a solenoid, so this one is put in partially, and it's the same idea, it's, so it's situated, it's orientated the same way. Current is flowing in this direction, upwards here and in through that spot there. And so my thumb would go up there and it would kind of coil around that first one. And if I put that all the way Right, my fingers would wrap inside that end there and you'd end up with a self pole magnet there. And so if you actually put a magnet inside of a solenoid, what would happen is this north end of the magnet would be attracted to that self pole of the solenoid, the electromagnet, and this thing would actually get pulled inwards. Right? And that's essentially how your doorbell works. Um, if you have an old fashioned doorbell, it's just uh, a magnet inside of a solenoid and when you press the button they go ding dong um, <clears throat> it's essentially uh, a magnet attached to a spring which is partially inside of a solenoid and as soon as you pass current through it that's when your finger presses down the doorbell uh, this thing will slide inwards and then hit a chime which is just at the very end there or likewise if you flip this magnet around and you turn uh, or even just inverse reverse the current make the current flow that way instead uh, the north and south pole magnets will reverse, and if you turn the, uh, the solenoid on, this south pole would be, I'll reverse that, uh, this south pole would be next to that south pole, so of course, if you put current through this going in the exact opposite direction, it's going to t uh, reverse, so this south pole is going to go left, and of course, the north pole is uh, repelled away from that north pole and attracted to that south pole, so it's going to go in the opposite direction. So solenoids are useful for that reason. So again, uh, this is just a, uh, a visualization of what it looks like inside if you actually turn on. So it's a very, very simple solenoid. It's not wrapped around like the two that you see here. Often, sometimes you can have solenoids that have thousands of individual wraps and they even get more complicated where they have a wrap over top of a wrap. So they double wrap, triple wrap, quadruple wrap, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> but essentially your magnetic field uh, is pretty constant and it makes those loops. Uh, this is just a little animation to kind of explain what I was getting at in the last little video there. I probably should remember I'd had this on there. Um, <clears throat> so if you pass current through it, it's going to create uh, a magnetic field inside the solenoid here. And very often, uh, so this is kind of what a doorbell is like, very often you have it attached to a spring so that when you turn the current off, it'll go back to its original position so they can get done all over again. So this is a very rough one that somebody made and uh, just put on mine, he just took a lot of copper cable and he wrapped it around a little uh, tube, if you will, and he has a magnet that's half in, half out, and as soon as he turns it on, it gets sucked in. Um, it's not gonna go on forever, so very often it'll just go until one end is lined up with the uh, north or south pole of whatever uh, magnet's here. I don't know what direction he's actually has the current going on in this, and I don't know how his, uh, wires are arranged so I'll just call this in the south pole just for lack of care. If this is the north pole of a magnet or north pole of the magnet would probably be in there for this bar magnet. Once it gets to this spot with the current on it's going to stop moving. So if you want to build a rail gun, if you know what a rail gun is, cool, if not don't worry about it. But if you want to build a rail gun you'd have to be able to time this thing and put another solenoid there and situate it such that when this thing got halfway moving to where it wanted to go, have it so this solenoid shuts off and the next solenoid turns on so it can keep on getting pulled through. That's kind of the basic idea of a rail gun. Um, so, um, a right hand rule for number two for a solenoid, if you're gonna apply that to a solenoid, uh, kind of the way that I was talking about, but you can change the right hand rule such that your thumb is not the direction of the current, but you can make it the direction of your magnetic field such that if you know the direction of the current, so, oh, sorry, I thought that hand was not attached. Uh, if you can control the flow of the current, you can actually wrap your fingers around as if you're grabbing the whole coil and your fingers will act in the direction of the current and your thumb will point um, in the direction of your magnetic field. 
such that it will point. So you're, if you imagine wrapping your hand, grab and gripping the solenoid here, your thumb will point to the left, which tells you this would be the north end and it would have to wrap around to the south end. So you can use your right hand rule number two as well to figure out the direction of your uh, magnetic field if you want to make your thumb the uh, magnetic field. <clears throat> so where you guys see it, your basic place of everyday solenoids and electromagnetism, again, is your doorbell. Um, <clears throat> but where you probably mostly deal with this is your speakers. All of your speakers have solenoids on there and current passes through those solenoids based on uh, the frequency of your music. And so that just creates electric impulses, which of course controls a magnet. Um, speakers have been getting smaller lately because of neodymium magnets, they're much stronger magnets. Um, but essentially the solenoid just pulsates, uh, the very simplest speakers, the solenoid just pulsates the magnet which is attached to a diaphragm, and that diaphragm is moving the air at the same frequency of your music, and therefore creates the music that you're listening to. Now that's the, the quick little two cent tour of a speaker. Um, obviously they could get a little bit, quite a bit more complex. There's quite a bit more layers to them, uh, but that is the nitty gritty simple version of it. Um, <clears throat> also, junkyard scrap metals, but I don't think you guys go to many junkyards. You probably just see them in TV and movies where it'll suck up a car. Uh, and that's how you can get your magnetism to be strong enough to lift a car, uh, is by electromagnetism. Um, for your homework, you'd probably see something like this, where it's like, oh, if current's flowing through there, where's the direction of the, um, of the magnetic field? Uh, and you might see batteries attached to in introduce you to the idea of the direction of flow of current. So again, uh, we're going to use conventional method and we're going to say current is flowing from the positive to the negative. If you want to use electron flow, instead of using your right hand, use your left hand. The le left hand is for electrons. But for your homework, you probably have to do something like this where you say, oh, okay, my thumb is wrapped around this way. And so therefore, if you're using your thumb with your current, you would just wrap your thumb around there and say, oh, okay, the fields are going into the top part of this. Uh, if my fingers are wrapped around that way, and therefore that must be the south pole of the magnet if it's wrapping in so that my fingers go into the hole at the top. And therefore, if I were to draw the whole thing, this is drawn with a mouse, so this is very, very terrible drawing. I would just draw only, I'd only typically just draw one little loop around, uh, not three or four or five going around further and further away. I typically just draw the one coming from the north pole, going into the south pole. And if you want to continue drawing on the inside, inside the solenoid would be like inside of a magnet, uh, where the flow of the magnetic field goes from the south to the north. But for all intents and purposes, otherwise, outside of all magnets, it's always going to flow from the north to the south. So, Orsted found out that um, <clears throat> current can cause a deflection in the magnetic field. So what happens if you put a wire with current flowing through it, with charges flowing through it in the presence of an external magnetic field? Well, it's going to also receive a deflection. It's going to experience a force. So if you have charges moving through it, so the way I have my hand situated, my right hand rule, my magnetic field is going from the north magnet to the south pole magnet, right? We'll have to assume there's a south pole up there, a north pole up there, but You'll just have to go with me on this one. This is not a monopole. The flow of our magnetic field is going from left to right. So therefore my middle finger will stick uh, from the left pointing to the right. Uh, and the way I situate my right hand rule, my current would be going into the page. You can't see my index finger. Uh, so therefore you'll just have to assume that behind those knuckles, my index finger is pointing into the screen. Therefore my thumb points down and this cable will experience a force going downwards. So this cable would be encouraged to move because of this external magnetic field. And I usually do a demo in class to show this, and it basically looks like this. I like his magnet a bit more. It's a bit more sophisticated. Um, and so if the south pole of the magnet's up top and the north pole of the magnet's down below, I can see that this conductor is being forced out to the left here so my magnetic field will be going upwards right my current is flowing down there but it's flowing slightly down and to the right i would probably call it out of the page uh, here and so because my this little cable is deflecting down and left 
right? It's going down and left in that direction. Why did I draw in black? I would say that's the direction of my force according to my right hand rule. So that's something that I do in class. Again, his looks a bit nicer. I still do basically the same setup. <clears throat> so gives you a rough idea of all the fun you're missing by not being in school. Um, so mathematically, here's how we can calculate that force. So I'll just go through this example. So suppose you have a small little wire there. It's 3.6 centimeters in length and it carries a current of 22 amps. Yikes, that would be really, uh, running from uh, right to left. Calculate the magnetic the magnitude, I can't read all of a sudden, the magnitude and direction of the magnetic force acting on the wire if it is placed in a magnetic field with magnitude 50 micro teslas uh, directed up the page. So my magnetic field is going upwards, my flow of current is going to the left, so my current is flowing to the left. I'm assuming we're talking about the flow, so electrons would be going in the opposite direction, so therefore as electrons move to the right they would leave tiny little positive poles or positive charges, if you will, we're gonna go with that. So they would have a flow to the left and therefore I can say Q, uh, Q times B is going to the left. So if I get my right hand rule involved, I will point my pointer finger to the left, right? My middle finger is lined up with my magnetic field going straight up and my force, my thumb, if you will, which you can't see because my hand is situated that way. So I put the force on the palm of my hand, it's going into the page. I therefore know that my force is going to the page, which is in the negative z direction, so I'll just call that negative k. So my vector force is whatever my magnitude is going to be from the calculation in the negative z direction. So denoted that with the negative k unit vector. So I've got my direction. The math, I'll just say, okay, well, my force equals my charge times my velocity of the charge multiplied by my magnetic field. Um, I'm going to ignore sine theta because I can see that my uh, velocity and my magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. So sine theta, sine 90 degrees is one. Let's ignore that. I know that current is my charge divided by my time. So I wasn't given my velocity. So therefore, I'm just going to say charge divided by time. And I was given charge in the equation. So actually, sorry, I was given current. So I need to get the charge out of the equation. So I need that current equation there. Uh, if I manipulate it, I can replace Q with I times my change in time, right? I also don't know my speed of the charges flowing through it, my velocity, if you will. I know the direction, but not the actual magnitude. So I have to get creative with that. I know that velocity or even speed is my distance traveled divided by the time. So I can replace that in this equation because I was given how long the cable is. So that's my distance, length. So if I substitute that distance in, I can uh, distance over time for my velocity, I can get rid of that delta t. Once I get rid of delta t, I have my equation, the force acting on the magnetic force acting on any cable is dependent on the current flowing through the cable, the distance the charges flow, otherwise known as the length of the actual wire in the magnetic field. So we'll change that d to an l and multiplied by the magnetic field. So this is dependent on the actual angle between the magnetic field and the current flow, but uh, I'll show that in the next screen. So put those numbers through. You were given uh, current, you were given the length of the cable, um, and you're given the magnetic field. So you would just work that through, and the magnetic field has two sets of units, either a newton per coulomb meter per second, or if you take that per second with the meter per second and combine it with the coulomb, an amp is a uh, is the equivalent of a coulomb per second. So really, this set of units is just a combination of the previous set of units for Teslas that I gave you in the previous video. Cancel off the units that don't need to be there, and you're basically left with uh, four times 10 to the negative five newtons. And if you get the direction involved there, we know it's going in the negative z direction, it's going into the page. So therefore, your force in vector notation is negative four uh, times 10 to the five uh, newtons. So <clears throat> mathematically, you can therefore abandon this equation for the force of a particle moving through a magnetic field. So again, we ignored sine theta in the last example because it was perpendicular. Uh, but we can abandon this equation due to proper substitutions for this new equation whenever we're talking about the force acting on a conducting cable in the presence of a magnetic field. 
So an example diagram that you have here, uh, if current was flowing from the left to the right and the magnetic field is going to the page, you'd experience a force going up according to the right hand rule. So um, again, it's very important that you recognize that that current, that cable is only going to be deflected because of an external magnetic field, uh, not the internal magnetic field created by itself. It has to be in the presence of an external magnetic field. If no external magnetic field, it's not going to move. <clears throat> that was an issue at some point, so I had to make that large screen. So we'll do this last question as an example, and then I'll stop this video. If you heard enough, by all means, stop the video. Calculate the magnitude of the magnetic force on a wire in a uniform magnetic field. So a piece of wire about 45.2 centimeters long has a current of 12 amps flowing through it. Um, looks like according to the diagram, it's flowing to the right. Uh, the wire moves uh, through the magnetic field of 0.3 Teslas. Calculate the magnitude of the magnetic force on the wire when the angle between the magnetic field and the wire is at zero degrees, 45 degrees, and 90 degrees. So in other words, we're talking about three different scenarios. This diagram is showing scenario B, but we'll assume the other two scenarios as well. So we have to do this problem three times. Once for when we're, our magnetic field is parallel with the cable, once for when the magnetic field is perpendicular, so that's 90 degrees with the cable, and once when we're at the actual diagram, 45 degrees to the cable. So, <clears throat> I'll do A first, because that's the order, and also that's the simplest one to do, because we know sine of zero is zero, and therefore your force will be zero. Hooray, no math. Moving along. I'm gonna skip to C for reasons you'll see in a moment. Uh, your force, <clears throat> the force on this cable when our magnetic field is perpendicular, right? So I'll just mathematically, it's just a matter of plugging in the numbers, 12 minutes length of the cable, so 0.452 meters, multiply by 0.3 um, uh, Teslas, newtons per amp meter. So work that math through, you'll get 1.6 newtons. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to know what the vector direction is, you would get your right hand rule involved. So there's my hand, right? The current's pointing to the right, because I'm talking about the case where my magnetic field is a blue arrow pointing straight up 90 degrees to the cable. So my middle finger is going straight up into the air. And my thumb, which you kind of see there, is pointing at you guys out of the screen. So there's my direction, it's coming out of the screen. So out of the screen would be in my positive Z direction. So I've got that. Now let's go to part B, and you'll see why I skipped part B at first. If you notice, ILB is going to be the same. So really, I've already calculated most of what the force is in part B. 1.6, roughly 1.6 Newtons a rounding value. So if I just replace ILB with what I calculated when my force is 90 degrees at a maximum force, again this is when our force acting on the cable is at its maximum value, since I'm going to be at a 45 degree angle I'm basically going to be at almost 71 percent the strength of force at 45 degrees. So or if you don't believe me you can just work those numbers through, put all these original numbers in ILB and just do it again yourself, but I'm just going to Take a shortcut, 1.6 Newtons times sine 45 will give you about 1.2 Newtons. And since it's uh, at a 45 degree angle, it's not gonna change the direction of the force. The force vector is always gonna be perpendicular to both your magnetic field and your um, uh, current or the direction of your charges, sorry, the velocity of your charges, no matter what. So the direction of the force is not gonna change. The only thing that's gonna change with this thing being at uh, at an angle is the overall strength of your force. So about 70% of the original strength at 90 degrees. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because that's enough. You should be able to complete all the questions up to page 88 from unit four, um, number eight. It's probably where you finish number eight and then after that you'd have to go and read all the notes that I didn't cover because um, it gets into um, calculating a magnetic field, the magnetic field produced by the cable. Um, but that is not going to be on any assessment for you guys. It's worth knowing. Um, but again, COVID made us lose a month. So that's where we're expected to go to. Okay, email me if you have any questions. And until next time.